I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Hi, I'm Luke Ryan for JoeBlow.com and welcome to Movie Endings Explained, where we'll be taking a look at some of the more ambiguous and discussed movie endings that have left audiences debating their true meaning long after the credits have rolled. This time we're going to look at the Oscar-winning 2007 thriller from the Coen brothers, No Country for Old Men, a tightly wrought, tension-filled tale of a simple welder who finds two million dollars in the desert after a drug deal gone bad and ends up on the run from a hitman hired to recover the money. Josh Brolin plays Llewellyn Moss, the man who finds the money and tries to make off with it to deadly consequences, and Javier Bardem in an Oscar-winning performance plays Anton Sugar, the hitman in question. In a lot of ways, the entire movie is a cat and mouse chase between the two, and we see Anton's path of calm yet lethal destruction as he attempts to hunt down Moss. However, there is a third main character played by Tommy Lee Jones, Sheriff Bell, who is also trying to track down the money but at the same time, find the hitman who is killing everyone in his way to get to the money. Bell doesn't enter into the film until after the first 25 minutes, but he quickly becomes a central figure in the movie as we intercut between all three men during the story. Interestingly enough, none of the three main characters share any screen time whatsoever, despite how closely connected they all are. They may occupy the same space in scenes, but you never see them on screen at the same time. No Country for Old Men was adapted from the Cormac McCarthy book of the same name, and while there are differences between the book and the movie, including a little more meat to the Sheriff's character towards the end, there's not that much that really sheds more insight into the conclusion of the movie. So to get into the ending that has confused some people, or merely just provided certain movie watchers with an unsatisfying conclusion, we need to get into spoiler territory. Llewellyn Moss ends up getting unceremoniously killed off screen towards the end of the film, and Sheriff Bell gets to the scene too late. It comes out of nowhere and leaves little to be desired after such an involved and personal feud between Moss and Anton that was surely going to be paid off in a face-to-face -face confrontation. That's the best deal you're gonna get. I won't tell you you can save yourself, because you can't. Yeah, I'm gonna bring you something, all right? I decided to make you a special project of mine. You ain't gonna have to come look for me at all. Then we almost get a showdown when Bell is outside the motel room where Moss was killed, where the money was surely hidden and Anton is inside, waiting for Bell to enter. Early on in the film, Bell investigates the trailer of Llewellyn Moss and lets his young deputy Wendell go in first. Perhaps this is a sign of Bell's realisation that he's no longer fit enough to lead the charge in a time where he is finding himself increasingly out of his depth. This time, however, he's alone, and given the fact that most of his relatives were lawmen who died in a blaze of glory too young, it appears that he almost wants to accept his own fate. He knows how dangerous Anton is, and has no backup. However, once he enters, Anton has disappeared, and his life is spared. It was almost as if Bell was suicidal in this moment, knowing that he probably had no chance to take on this psychopathic killer, but he did it anyway, and that's an interesting character choice. Following this scene, we see Moss's late wife Carla Jean, played by Kelly MacDonald, confronted with Anton in her home. He explains that Moss had the chance to save her life by giving up his, but chose to save his own skin. It's left fairly ambiguous as to whether or not Anton murdered Carla Jean, but if you notice him checking his feet, it calls back to earlier in the film when he removed his socks after a series of murders in a motel. And given how little reason he needed to slaughter other characters earlier in the film, I mean literally side characters on the side of the road, it stands to reason that he did in fact kill Carla Jean. It is the best I can do. Call it. No. I ain't gonna call it. Call it. The coin don't have no say. It's just you. Her questioning of whether or not killing her had anything to do with the chance of a coin toss, or a decision he had already made in his mind, continues to raise the theme of fate and circumstance that colours the entire movie. And in what would have ordinarily been a cruel twist of fate, we see Anton get in a car wreck. We can see that the traffic light above the road actually read green, so Anton proceeded to drive, 
but nothing is certain, and the chance nature of life caught up with him eventually. Still, he manages to survive like a cockroach and shuffles out of the film. The final scene sees Sheriff Bell, restless in his retirement, telling his wife about a dream he had concerning his father. In this moment we see that the semi-twist of the film is that this is Bell's story. In fact, the opening of the film is narrated by Bell, which bookends the film nicely, and he tells a story of a time when you didn't even need to carry a gun as a sheriff, a role that both his father and grandfather had held, and he laments the increasing violence of the time period that the film is set in, 1980. It's a movie where the sheriff never cracks the case, and is only left with the murdered body of the man he was trying to protect. Ultimately, the film is a tragedy, with no hope in sight. The good guys die, the bad guy lives, and the only character we have any interest in who's still left standing leaves us at the end of the movie by ruminating on his own mortality. How'd you sleep? I don't know. I had dreams. Well, you got time for them now. Anything interesting? All right, then. Two of them. Both had my father in them. It's peculiar. I'm older now than he ever was by 20 years. So, in a sense, he's the younger man. Anyway, the first one I don't remember too well, but it was about meeting him in town somewhere and he gave me some money. I think I lost it. The second one, it was like we was both back in the older times and I was a horseback going through the mountains for the night, going through this pass in the mountains. It was cold and there was snow on the ground and he would rode past me and kept on going, never said nothing going by, just rode on past. And he had his blanket wrapped around him, his head down. When he rode past, I seen he was carrying fire in a horn the way people used to do, and I, I could see the horn from the light inside of it, about the color of the moon. And in the dream, I knew that he was going on ahead. He's fixing to make a fire somewhere out there in all that dark and all that cold. And I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. And then I woke up. The fact that Bell is older than his father ever was by 20 years seems to play heavily on his mind in his dreams, along with money that he might have lost in another dream. They tell us that he feels like he's out of place, and that he lives in a country that isn't for old men like him, as the title of the film suggests. The lost money dream could point towards his lingering guilt of not being able to wrap up his last case with the two million dollars. He is also confronted with his existential crisis by his uncle, who tells him this. What you got ain't nothing new. This country's hard on people. You can't stop what's coming. They ain't all waiting on you. That's vanity. So the ending of No Country for Old Men is a quiet and simple one. In a movie that's filled with violence and cause and effect and fate and consequence, it simply shows an old man looking back on a dream he had and wondering what it all meant. When really, he's looking back on his whole life and pondering its meaning, which is something we all end up doing eventually. Yet maybe in a film that is so damn beat, Bell's yearning for meeting his father again with a fire waiting for them both to sit around is a sliver of hope for the goodness in life to reveal itself to him and that maybe not quite all hope is lost. What are your thoughts on the ending of No Country for Old Men? Do you think it's as clear cut as I made out? Or maybe there's more to former Sheriff Bell's dream than meets the eye? Be sure to chime in with your comments down below, and thanks for watching. And then I woke up. Thank you.